morning everyone my name is Fahad and today is 8th of November 2020 uh, thank you very much for joining us I would like to say a big welcome to all of you especially if you're joining us for the very first time thank you very much so we are in the lockdown again and maybe the things are not looking good and maybe we are under uh, big stress we can't meet meet each other in person we can't see our loved ones and we have to work from home but this is not the end of the world um, we, we don't have to worry about it it is a short-term stress which will be over soon and we are so blessed that we have blessing we have a faith and we have comfort of Jesus Christ which remains with us so let's let's uh, worship together today let's pray together and let's uh, look forward for the good times which are coming and today is also a remembrance Sunday which is a day to honor and give praise to those people who have fought for us to keep this country free so we are not in the church we cannot we, we cannot uh, honor them uh, in person but we can observe one minute silence uh, during the service so let's let's um, give them praise and honor and observe one minute silence now for them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for the great mercy you have done for us. We are so thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ which was given for us and we have the everlasting life and we have an everlasting gift of Holy Spirit with us. Father, we are so thankful. Heavenly Father, we would like to pray for, uh, for, for the people who uh, have fought for us during the war and they have died, Father, to keep this country free. Father, we would like to uh, thank you for their services and uh, thank you for their families and thank you for the encouragement uh, they have shown, Father, for this country. Father, we would like to pray for their families uh, to give them comfort and peace, Father. Uh, Father, we would like to pray for um, this country, Father, especially in this difficult time. Father, please help the politicians, help the government and help the NHS, Father, to to, to handle this pressure of this pandemic, Father. Father, as a whole, as a nation, Father, please help us uh, stand with us, Father, so we can go through this time together as we did in the past. Heavenly Father, to, for today's service, I would like to pray for the preacher. I would like to pray for uh, the band, Father, who is helping us um, at, uh, to go through um, uh, with, the, with the service, Father. So please lead us and guide us through the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, I would like to pray for uh, the technical team uh, who is helping us to upload the YouTube video. Uh, bless them and provide them resources. And Father, we would like to pray for um, any sort of uh, interruption we might have uh, for the for the internet or anything, Father. So please help us uh, uh, to uh, so we can keep um, the service uh, uh, going online smoothly. Uh, I ask this in your Son's mighty name. Amen. We're told in the scriptures that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we want to sing of his great mercy, his amazing grace this morning. So much stronger, the King of Glory, the King of. 
shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my lockdown and confusion and darkness. We know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we sing of our trust in him and his sovereignty over all things. Even as the hearts of men 
This morning we have uh, Jay, Jay Holmes, and she's just been out to Lesbos to work with refugees there as part of Christian Mission Agency. We know from the news that the big refugee camp, the Moria camp, was burnt down, and then uh, the refugees had to, to live in the open. That left them quite a lot of problems, uh, didn't it, Jay? So how were the people when you found them there on Lesbos? Mm. I think um, it was a, like a shock to them because it was a tent and they had a, such a like a, you know the um, storm so the, all the the roof was blown up and uh, they weren't ready for the rain so they could not sleep when it rained because it's all flooded and uh, but in a since then they managed to rectify it so now they got the pallets under their uh, the uh, you know the bed so at least they won't get flooded yeah. Mm -hmm. And who are the refugees on Lesbos? Where do they come from? What age are they? Mm. I think they are mostly from Afghan Afghanistan. They used to live in Iran. And uh, in Iran, they don't get treated well and not equally. So they all escape um, you know, to Turkey and then from Turkey to Lesbos. And there are like Nigerians and Congo and uh, Angola. And it's you know, a few Africans as well, but mainly from Afghanistan. Mm. And how many of them are actually Christians then of the 7,000 people on the island? And, um, we, uh, the families we met, there are um, I think 50 families at least, because that's where, how many packages we did. But at the moment, uh, they are doing refugee to refugee evangelizing in the camp. So there will be, we I suspect there will be more. And then few um, refugees are already Christian people from Angola or, um, uh, you know, all these African countries from Nigeria. Yes, they are uh, the Christians. So, but we don't know how many exactly. And you were there joining a mission which was headed up by a former imam. So tell us about him and how he came to be on Lesbos 
uh, ministering there. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the centre is run by German and the Korean together, and they're very much international. And that he was an um, imam, and he was a jihad, and that he was sent to Athens as a um, Muslim missionary. So he built uh, like a two mosques and that sort of thing. But there was a really sincere um, Christian. They never said, you know, come to the church or anything. And it, they just loved him. And the, after a few years, he was, a, a, he, the Lord met him. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, he was converted and he got um, nearly um, died because of, uh, you know, his conversion. So then he went to Germany as a refugee. And he is a still refugee, but, you know, thank God that um, he met this beautiful German um, wife wife and now they are married and so they uh, came to serve the refugees in Lesbos and which was a beautiful uh, couple you know so mm. so they had one house and then they thought that wasn't enough to meet the needs well what do they do in the house how do they serve the refugees Mm. I, um, uh, in the refugee camp, there is no shower or the washing facilities at all. So um, we give them coupon so one family uh, can come and have a shower and do the washing. It takes about an hour because uh, there's only one shower horse because uh, I had to take a look what it looks like. But you know, it's not anything fancy. It's a very simple. It's one water, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> popping out of the shower. And um, so, yeah, and uh, we have a children's ministry because uh, they closed the school um, since the Moria, uh, the camp uh, burned down. So there's a children's ministry and there is a, uh, next to it, there's a Bible study going. But mainly we ask people um, to come and have a tea and uh, eat some biscuits. And then we get to hear their stories and, uh, you know, they have opportunity to read the Bibles and there's always a Bible and the tracts and uh, little storybooks. So if they want to take it, and this is the only place where we can do the evangelizing and the pray for each other. But our presence, as the Imam said, your presence is the best thing because, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is in you and the you being here and then just give them a cuddle and they listen to their story that, you know, they know uh, in, that they will, should feel the God's presence. And so um, we didn't do too much, yeah, but just, uh, you know, that we cry sometimes to hear their stories and cry and pray together mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it, because have a um, language problem as well. You know, some of them speak a um, little bit of English, but most of them are Farsi. They speak Farsi, so we had to use uh, a converted um, Afghanistan to translate um, at the same time. Yeah, well, clearly, so many of them have terrible, tragic stories. So to be there and give hope is is a great thing. And you're also telling me that many of the Christians, the fifty families do get um, attacked in the refugee camp because they've come away out of Islam and obviously come to faith in Christ. And that means that they're very vulnerable to attacks even by their fellow refugees. Um, you went uh, just at the right time, didn't you, uh, really, in, in the grace of God? So just tell us about that. Uh, yes. Um, um... I just acted because um, when I heard uh, from um, uh, the internet they are looking for uh, uh, this help in a team. So I um, very quickly, um, the God gave me the, this desire. So I applied and very quickly went. And uh, if I delayed and I couldn't have gone because uh, um, I only had a few days uh, you know, before I left the country. And uh, now it's all locked down again, so I couldn't have gone. Um, and uh, so the timing was perfect. And uh, uh, yeah, and then when I think when I said um, I'm, I'm going, and then all of a sudden the people started to give me the money from our church and from outside of our church. And I didn't know why, because I'm not a missionary or anything. And uh, so then um, it was the money, uh, it was a 
beautiful encroachment for the Christian um, families and the, who are being bullied and persecuted in the camp. And the, so we could buy them necessity, even, you know, they didn't have a toothbrush or toothpaste, anything. So we bought um, like uh, for the 50 families. And so, uh, and then, you know, they know that from outside we are praying for them and we care for them. It was a, uh, to give the material thing, I didn't realize it was such an encouragement, you know, for them. Uh, so, yeah, it was... Um, um, uh. Great. Okay. Well, I know also it's very exciting you've become a grandma as well over the last uh, two or three weeks. So thank God for yeah. these exciting things in your life. And um, so let's pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you for those who are ministering for you by helping those who have very, very little in this world, who are obviously cooped up in a small island and, uh, Lord, are wondering what their future holds. And we do thank you for those who have come to faith in you, for all those who show uh, love and compassion to them. We pray that there will be a better and more permanent solution for the refugees on uh, Lesbos and those in the Maria camp. We pray that many more will come to find the love of God there. And we thank you for the ex-imam and for all those who are ministering to them. Please supply all of their needs, whether they're financial or spiritual or emotional or physical. And uh, we pray, Father, that uh, amidst all of this suffering, that there will be hope and love and kindness too. Thank you for uh, Jay and for her family. Do, do thank you for the blessing of uh, Alexander as well arriving. We pray for the whole family that your blessing would be upon them and you would continue to use her for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, great to chat, Jay. Thank you very much thank for telling the story. Yeah. Our God is a great big God.
Good morning, everyone. Later, Mark will be teaching us from Romans 6. And right now in our kids' lot, we are going to have a look at one of the verses from that passage. And the verse we're going to be looking at is Romans 6, 23. And it says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want to introduce you to Fire Lady Sally. Normally, Sally is a very hardworking Fire Lady, but today has been a bad day. First of all, Sally was late for work and then she sprayed one of her colleagues with the water hose on purpose. She stole the chief officer's chocolate bar and she pushed past everybody else so she could sit in the front seat at the engine. Oh dear, Sally deserves to be punished. So Sally, here's a cloth. I want you to go and clean all the dirty fire engines. Sally deserves to be punished and we are just like Sally. We deserve to be punished too because we do lots of bad things. The Bible calls those things sin. Sin is when we do bad things that make God sad. And the punishment we face is much worse than Sally's punishment. The punishment for sin is death. Can you see that in the verse, for the wages of sin is death. But, and this is a wonderful but, although we deserve death, we are given eternal life. We all love getting presents, don't we? We've got Christmas coming up. I wonder what you're hoping to open. We are given presents. We don't earn them. We don't give people money for them. They are given to us freely and God gives us the greatest gift we could ever receive and that is eternal life. Living forever with God, that is the greatest gift and it's given to us freely. We don't earn it and we definitely don't deserve it. We are given the gift of living with him forever. And that gift is only made possible through Jesus. Do you see that in the verse? But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We can only get this gift because of Jesus. What a wonderful God we have. How amazing is he? We deserve death, but we are given eternal life through Jesus as a gift. Why don't we say that verse together? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Let's pray as we finish. Oh, Father God, we praise you. You are amazing. We deserve death and yet you give us eternal life. You are wonderful and we praise you for your grace, your forgiveness, your kindness and most of all for Jesus because he makes it possible for that gift to be given. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a new day. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to connect together online and to pray together as a church. We proclaim, Lord, that you are Alpha and Omega, that you are creator and sustainer of all that we see around us. We proclaim that you are high above us, that your thoughts are higher than ours, that your ways are much higher than ours. And that as we come to you now, Lord, we thank you for the confidence that our prayers are heard by you, that we have direct access, Lord, to your throne that we can come before you and cry, Abba, Father. Father, we pray that you forgive us, Lord, for our trespasses and our sins. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have rebelled, that we have not placed you, Lord, in the centre of our lives. 
And even as we come and seek you, Lord, we pray that you uh, speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Dear God, we pray for Hope Hoppers and as various church members continue to reach out to families and children who do not know you. May you continue to grant us opportunities to speak about your love and your amazing work on the cross. We pray for the Windows of Hope project and that it will speak to lots of people in Sutton about the hope in Jesus we celebrate during the Advent season. May the window displays communicate how amazing that Jesus came to us as a human baby so that he could save us. We also pray for the ongoing developments in the United States of America election. We pray for peace and calm amongst the political leaders as well as the citizens. We pray your church in America will be a beacon of hope and unity and that they will heal any divisions by causing people to see that you are their ultimate leader and that your grace and mercy is what they need. Heavenly Father, we pray for the ongoing youth work at Hope Church with Ignite and Epic, as well as different Bible study groups. May they continue to speak the needs of the different young people who attend and be a place that they will learn more about you and your word. We pray that they will have the courage to really practice your word in their everyday lives when they go to school or college and when they interact with their families and friends. We pray for the youth leaders that you will bless them with wisdom and your leading as they plan, but also continue to strengthen and sustain them in their own personal lives as they grow in you. We also pray for all the young people who are continuing to attend school and university amidst all the ongoing restrictions. Please help them to keep safe. We pray that through our personal witness, or the Ministry of Organisations like Christian Unions, that there will be lots of opportunities for young people to hear of your grace and be encouraged by your word. Father, we pray for the leaders uh, in Hope Church Sutton, that you continue to grant them wisdom and your leading as they plan um, all the different uh, logistics uh, in response to the ongoing restrictions, uh, but also how best, Lord, to uh, be a shepherd to your flock. Um, we pray for all the work that's going on now uh, through the home groups, uh, through uh, the women's ministry, um, through the International Cafe. We pray, Father, that um, even as these go online, that you will um, grant the leaders wisdom as to how to use these opportunities, Lord, to speak of your great grace um, and love and mercy. We pray for uh, opportunities also for people to connect individually um, to help others Lord to grow in you. Father we pray also for uh, ongoing situations Lord in our world. We remember the situation in Nigeria. We pray for peace. We pray um, for unity Lord uh, amongst your people there. We pray that your church uh, will rise up uh, as a beacon that will uh, convey hope uh, and be an ambassador, Lord, of your uh, love to the people around them. Father, we pray um, that you continue to help um, leaders in this country, Lord, uh, know how best to uh, balance all the different competing priorities around finance, uh, safety, and the health, Lord, of the nation. We pray for those um, that are on the forefront uh, in the health system or in education, uh, that you will help them to uh, be able to do their jobs well um, amidst uh, all the uncertainty. We pray for those in our church lot um, who might be going through a tough time, whether it be work-related, um, finance-related, uh, or through um, difficult relationships. We just ask, Lord, that you be their comfort, that you will be their peace, and that you will help them, Lord, to turn their eyes to you. We thank you, Father, that you are our refuge, that you promise that you are our good shepherd, uh, and that you never fail us, Lord. 
Thank you, Father, that we can depend on you. That um, at times we can do nothing, Lord, but depend on you. Lord, speak to us through your word. Help us see the truth in it um, that not only applies to our lives but those around us. Help us to be communicators of that truth in love. And help us, Lord, to be generous in our love and kindness uh, for people who really need that, Lord, around us. So help us as a church, Lord, to be humble before you, to realise that through this time of uncertainty and anxiety that we have a sure hope, Lord, in you. And let us now all pray together the words that you taught us through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin, and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, to now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hi everyone, welcome to Hope Church Sutton. My name's Mark Fossey, I'm one of the pastors at church. Sadly, of course, we're in lockdown again, but here we go, we're going to have our sermon now. Before we have our sermon, before I pray, I've got a question for you to discuss with the people in the room with you, or if you're on your own, you just have to think about it yourself. Here's my question. I want you to imagine that I could promise you personal exemption from the coronavirus laws. So as of now, you and you alone and your family, you are allowed to do anything you want and the coronavirus laws do not apply to you. Right? I want you to imagine and just quickly discuss for a moment what are you going to do this week and this month? What are you going to do with your life now that the rules, the law, do not apply to you? Go for it.
Why don't I pray? Father God, please help us as we think about your word and listen to your word. Please speak to us, we pray. Challenge and encourage our hearts in equal measure, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So you want to be in Romans chapter 6. This series we're doing in Romans, we've called the title Set Free. We, all of us, are sinners. That's what it teaches us. Whoever we are, whatever we've done, some worse, some better, but all of us are sinners. And all of us can be justified by faith. If you believe in Jesus, then he dies for your sins and you're forgiven. And that means you're set free. You're set free in many ways from an old you to being a new you. You're set free, first of all, from being under sin, being in Adam. And instead, we are under righteousness. That's the new change. We were under condemnation, judgment for our sin. But now we're under grace. Grace is what covers us. Whatever we do, wherever we go, we're under grace. We used to be under the sentence of death because of our sin, but now we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And we used to be under the law, the Old Testament law, bound by the law, but now we're no longer under the law, but we live by the Spirit. And that's to come in chapter 7. This idea of being under something is what rules you, what controls you. It's the sentence you're under. If you're a Christian... You are under grace, you are living under righteousness, you're living under the realm of life and in the spirit. And that's what Christianity is all about. That's what life as a Christian is about. Last week we talked about how, well, if we're saved by grace, then whatever we do, does that mean we can do anything we like? And Paul says, by no means. And he gave this clear illustration that comes out through baptism. The old us died as if when you go under the water, and the new us is alive. If that's who you are, the old you is dead and the new you is alive, then be who you are, be the new alive you. And in many senses, today's talk is, is an identical replica of last week, except it's a different illustration. It's an illustration about boss. And so here's my first point. Who's the boss? Sin or righteousness? Paul starts this section from verse 15 with a question. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? You see where he's coming with the question? As I showed you a minute ago, we're not under law, we now live by the Spirit. Well, if we're not under law and religious rules and the rules of the Bible don't count for us anymore, the right question you might ask is, does that mean I can do what I want? Does that mean I can get away with whatever I want? We were asking that question a minute ago, weren't we? When we this idea of, um, do I, if, if, the, if I was exempt from the laws of coronavirus... Does that mean I can do what I want? We all understand that instinct of, I'm free so I can do what I want. Now, that was a lot like the question Paul asked last week. And, and his answer again is, by no means. And he, he gives an illustration, not about death and life, but about bosses. He actually uses the language of slavery. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Here he's saying, look, if you're set free now from sin because we're under grace, okay, in your freedom, which way are you going to live? You can either live for sin or you can live for righteousness. Now, he uses the word, the language of slavery. We have a difficulty with this language of slavery in our day and age because Slavery in our mind uh, brings up uh, images of kidnapping African people and taking them to the new world and, and the appalling abuses of slavery. Okay? The reason Paul uses this language in his context many hundreds and thousands of years before that was because, as he puts in verse 19, I'm using the example from everyday life because of your human limitations. In other words, he's looking around him in the first century. Oh, slavery is a great illustration of of the Christian life. Now, I don't actually think it's a great expression for us because our, our culture is different. So I'm not going to use the language of slavery just because of the connotations it brings up in our minds. I'm just going to use the language of boss because that's what slavery is. A slave is someone who has an owner whom they have to obey. And all of us who have jobs know about having a boss, someone we've got to obey. So I'm just going to use the language of boss rather than slavery because that's the context for us. 
And the question is, who's your boss? Sin or righteousness? In your freedom, you're not under sin anymore. You get to choose in your life, in your freedom, who am I going to live for? Sin or righteousness? I don't think we realise this, but when we make this choice, one of these two, we are putting ourselves under a new boss. That's the point Paul's making. Do you not see that when you choose this path, you're choosing a new boss or choose this path, you're choosing a new boss? Who am I going to let rule me, dictate or have authority over me? Is it going to be my sin or righteousness? Which am I going to choose? And he says sin, which leads to death. Or, right, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, we'll explain more about those as we go through. But you see the point he's making. I've just been set free from death. Do I want to now let sin rule me, which leads to death? Some Christians do this. Christians, I should say. That is to say, they think, well, I can do what I want. I'm free. And so I will. I'll live for myself. And the warning here is, if you live for yourself, if you choose to disobey God, and if you find yourself reading bits of the Bible and go, yeah, but that bit doesn't apply to me. I interpret that in a different way because I want to live this way. If you find yourself going this way, living for what I want, then sin leads to death. That's the point he's making. Or I can choose to live for righteousness and follow the way of the spirit. That's the other option. Who's your boss? Who is your boss? Who are you going to choose? That's the first very quick point. Secondly, the second point is this. Know who you are, you are free from sin and work for righteousness. Let me read from verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. Righteousness is your new boss. So you need to understand that when you become a Christian, you are free, but freedom is a relative term. You're free from something. You used to be under sin. You're now free from under sin. But you're not totally free, actually. You're now under God. It's not freedom to be totally free. It's freedom from that which was bad, sin and death, and transfer to a new owner. You have a new ownership, a new boss. God, righteousness. You saw that illustration in, in the Exodus, remember? The Israelites were slaves in Egypt and God, by a mighty, powerful miracles, brought them out of slavery in Egypt. But he brought them to Mount Sinai where he was. And he said, now I am your God and you are my people. They transferred ownership from Pharaoh to God. And so it is as a Christian. That's exactly what that's all about. We used to belong to death and sin. And now we belong to righteousness, to God. He's our new owner. Now, notice the language here in verses 17 and 18. It's you have been. Thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves. This is, this is a fact. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. This is a true reality. It's what is. And it's so important that we understand. You need to. Who are we? If I can understand who I am, then I can be what I am. And that's the point of this second point. Know who you are. You have and you were, you used to belong to sin. That's who your old boss was. But when you believed in Jesus, you have been bought by a new owner. You do have a new boss. I always remember Harry Redknapp, the old Harry Redknapp, the football manager. He used to, I can't remember which way around, but he used to be the manager of Portsmouth. And then he quit Portsmouth to go and become the manager of Southampton. And Southampton's just up the road, local rivals. And it was very controversial at the time because they're rivals and he quit Portsmouth to go and work for Southampton. I also remember on, on the next day, all the Sky Sports cameras were all at Portsmouth to interview. You know, you've just lost your manager, he's left you, you know, that sort of thing. And the cameras all set up in the car park. That morning, Harry Redknapp has woken up and he must have gone on autopilot. Maybe he was tired, I don't know. And he's got in his car and he's driven down the motorway and he's driven to his job in, in the, and he's driven into the car park. And, they, and then he looks up and he sees the Sky Sports cameras. He sees Portsmouth Football Club on the front of the office. And there's this brilliant moment where the camera captures his face. He's like, oh, I've gone to the wrong job. What an idiot. <laughs> I don't work here anymore. I work for Southampton. And quickly he drove off before the cameras could catch him anymore and went off to his new job. He forgot. 
He worked for the old place and he needed to go to the new place. You need to get into your identity who you are. I don't work for sin anymore. That's the old me, the me that's dead, if you like. The new me that's alive now works for God. He's my new boss for righteousness. I'm seeking to please righteousness, seeking to please him, not the old me that I'm set free from sin. Does that make sense? So if we can, as Christians, get into our head who I work for, who is my boss, not sin, doing what I want for me, but God, then we're half the battle is won. Know who you are. And thirdly, if you know who you are, then be who you are. Be who you are. Offer yourselves not to sin, but to righteousness. Have a look at the middle of verse 19. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. See how he's saying? Know who you are and therefore offer yourselves. Be what you are. Be who you are. Now notice how he puts it, you see. He says sin leads to ever increasing wickedness and then ultimately to death. But if you obey righteousness and righteousness is your boss, then that leads to ever increasing holiness and ultimately eternal life. So there's benefit or, or loss both in this life and into eternity. So as you're looking down these two paths, who am I going to obey? Myself and sin or God and his word and righteousness? I'm looking at benefits now and into eternity. So if sin is what I live for, it will damage my conscience, it will damage my relationship with Christians and God and God's word. One of the most common ways I've seen people give up Christianity is through inappropriate relationships of many different kinds. But relationships where I know as I'm about to embark on this, I know this is not right. I know I shouldn't be doing this. And yet I'll self-justify, I'll tell myself, yes, but I feel loved and, and it makes me feel happy and, 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 and this person fulfills me and I, I can't see that God would have a problem with this, although secretly I know in my heart of hearts he, he does. And so bit by bit what I'll do is I'll distance myself from, well, the bits of the Bible that make me feel uncomfortable and eventually I'll, I'll distance myself from the Bible itself because just the Bible makes me feel uncomfortable. And so I'll distance myself from church because, well, that's where the Bible's read and that makes me feel uncomfortable. And besides, there's people there that might disapprove of this relationship I'm now in. And some of those people will go and find another church where everyone will tell them they're right. And they'll stop listening to the people that might tell them the hard things and they'll f surround themselves with people that tell them this is wonderful. It's the most wonderful thing, probably because they're doing it themselves. And bit by bit, my conscience becomes harder. Bit by bit, I self-justify and sin becomes normal. And by that point, I've drifted away from God. My relationship with him is on the rocks. I've prayed for ages and I've just drifted, drifted, drifted. Like a boat that's tied away from its moorings. Just slowly, bit by bit, drifted away, drifted away, drifted away. And all because really... I didn't want righteousness to be my boss. I wanted myself, my pleasure, my sin to be my boss. Now, I've seen that in other areas of people's lives. I've seen that with Sunday sports and I've seen that with other hobbies. I've seen that just with a desire to live a comfortable life in a nice place. And bit by bit, rather than obeying righteousness, I'm, I'm obeying myself for my comfort, my sin. And bit by bit, imperceptibly, distance from God, salvation becomes less interesting to me, Jesus is more and more distant, the Bible was something I used to read, and then death. Sin leads to ever more increasing wickedness, but the other way around is wonderful, you see. Imagine I was, let's take the relationship example, imagine I said um, at the beginning, I know this in my conscience, I really want to do this, but I know it's wrong, and so even though this is hard, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no to that relationship and yes to living under righteousness. Even though that's really hard, you'll see the benefit in your life. It will strengthen you in your faith. It will strengthen you in your confidence and in your assurance. In fact, funnily enough, as you say no in one area of your life and yes to righteousness, you'll find it easier to say no in other areas of your life. 
You'll feel, you'll feel more open in your relationship with God because you're living his way. <clears throat> you will know and be reading his word because that's what you chose rather than myself. You'll feel freer in your conscience. You'll feel right. And bit by bit, it will lead to eternal life as well as increasing holiness in this life. Increasing holiness isn't something that magically comes to you. It's by choosing day after day, bit by bit by bit, to live by righteousness rather than to live by sin. Why should I do it? Because that's who I am. He gives us two more reasons which are really helpful. One is to look back and see the negative. One is to look forward and see the potential future. It's like the ghost of Christmas past and the ghost of Christmas future. Have a look at how he talks about the, the past in verse 20. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. See, you, you, you were free in the sense that you were free from righteousness, but you were under sin. But then he says, verse 21, but what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Why would I go back into something when I look back and that, that was a, an awful way to live, that controlled my life. Why didn't I just say no? It's like an alcoholic going back to drinking alcohol. Don't you remember how devastating it was for you? I know it seems attractive. I know it seems desirous for you right now. Sin always does. But that was mental. Do you not remember how destructive and how wrong? And you were ashamed of those things. You turned away from them. You see, looking back. But the other way is to look forward. See, see how he puts it, end of verse 21. Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Look down the line. Look this where this is going. Not just in this life, but into eternity. If I carry on turning away from God, even though I know I'm doing it in my conscience, do you see where this is going, brother or sister? But if I say no to that and say yes to righteousness, because that's who I am, this will end up in righteousness and eternal life. You see where you're going? This is serious. It's a big thing. Note as well, as well, he, how he puts it, it's just in case for people who might slip into the accidental way of thinking, which is, oh, if I, if I obey righteousness, then I earn eternal life. He doesn't. He says the wages of sin is death. You get what you deserve. Judgment is fair, but the free gift of God is eternal life. See, a Christian is someone who always lives under grace every morning. Thank you, Jesus, that I am saved and that you have saved me. Now I want to live for you. Let me ask you, who are you offering yourself to in your life right now? What does your conscience tell you? Maybe you're someone who's really drifted from God because you've made a big decision in your life and you can see that you're all drifting and you're already on that drift. Or maybe there's a certain area of your life, just one small part of your life, that you secretly know you are obeying sin rather than obeying righteousness in that area of your life. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, whichever it is, say no to it, turn away from it, repent now is the time and come back and let God be the boss of that area of your life so why should I not just live for myself and for sin number one know who you are the old me is dead the new me is alive I'm a new person I used to obey sin. That's what I used to do. And I'm now ashamed of that. But now I've been bought by God that I belong to him so that I might please him and obey righteousness. That's who I am. That's my new job. That's my new boss. And I want to please my boss in everything. That's who I am. Find yourself, if you can, saying no to the old me. No to that which is dead. No to that which is offered to the old boss. I used to obey those old desires. I used to obey that which I know I'm ashamed of. But now I obey righteousness because I belong to God. And if I do this, I know I will receive the free gift of eternal life rather than death. Which will you choose? Let's pray. Father God, these things are hard. 
for all of us because sin is so enticing, every one of us. And yet thank you that you've set us free from the rule of sin and death, that we might belong to you in Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, therefore help us to say no to the old ways, the old me which entices me, and say yes to that which is good, not because it earns me eternal life, for you've given us grace upon grace for free, but because that's who I am, that's who we are. We want to be who we are. Forgive us, cover our sin with grace, energise us and give us strength to live for you, for that is joy, that is benefits in this life and benefits in eternity. Thank you for your grace to us in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I love the lines to one of the verses in this last song, which says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it for your courts above. Come thou found.
Thank you very much uh, for the great sermon uh, we have heard today. And thank you very much uh, for the great worship uh, we have done together. It was uh, really amazing and encouraging even in, in this uh, lockdown. Uh, there are too many things which are going around here in our church. We have tons of uh, other stuff. Uh, you can find all details uh, on the church website. We have Hope Hoppers. We have um, different community groups. So please feel free to uh, go on the website and, and uh, so you can find all details. And if you have any query, please speak to Mark or uh, Tim, who um, are the pastors of our church. And uh, don't forget to join us um, for a catch-up after the, after the church service. Uh, you can find the Zoom details on the church uh, website. And uh, the time is 11.15, uh, just after the church. So thank you very much and see you there.